Hi everybody, this is Mrs. G, and today we're going to review some important parent functions and compositions of functions. Right, I have a quick warm-up for you guys, um, so please pause the video and give it a try. All right, go ahead and check your work here. Um, so this first one's a constant function, so it's y equals negative 3, so a horizontal line at um, the y value negative 3. Here, this is a linear function, so if you rewrite it in slope-intercept form, it's a little bit easier to graph. And then here, this is a quadratic function, so I'd start by finding the vertex. So I use the vertex formula here, or you could rewrite it um, in vertex form, and then you can find a couple of additional points. Um, I also like to remember that um, all quadratic functions follow this vertical growth pattern. I say 1, 3, 5. It's the vertical distance from the vertex to the next coordinate, and then this is the vertical distance from that coordinate to the next. Um, and then we adjust this for any um, stretch or shrink, vertical stretch or shrink. So if you actually multiply this by negative 2, our vertical growth pattern is negative 2, negative 6, negative 10. So notice this distance from here to here is negative 2. This distance is negative 6. And then the distance to the next coordinate would be um, negative 10. And that would be like the next coordinate um, at a whole number to the right or left. Um, so again, that's just a little trick I use, but however you graph quadratics is fine with me. All right, so I'm going to do a general overview of all the different types of functions um, that hopefully you remember from your previous math classes. And I'm going to highlight some key things to remember for each type of function. Um, so the first one is just a linear function. The most um, basic parent function is just y equals x. It looks like this, so it goes through the origin, it has a slope of positive 1. The domain and range are all real numbers. Just a few things to remember, you can um, rewrite a linear function in the slope-intercept form, y equals mx plus b, and this is the slope and this is our y-intercept. Um, you can also use um, point-slope form, or this is also useful if you're creating a linear function, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, and here's our slope formula. Um, right here, where it's essentially rise over run. So just a few things to remember about our linear functions. All right, the next uh, function to look at would be our absolute value function. So um, f of x equals absolute value of x would be the parent function. And it looks like this. It's that V-shaped graph. And everything to the right of our origin is really just the function y equals x. And then this side is the function y equals negative x. So it's actually kind of a piecewise function of two linears. Um, but uh, I just like to remember it's that V-shaped graph. Our domain is all real numbers. You can take the absolute value of any number. But our range for the parent function is 0 to infinity. Of course, that could change if there's some type of um, reflection or vertical shift. A um, few things to remember. If it's written kind of in this transformational form, our vertex is going to be at h, k, um, and this a value is really the slope of our line to the right, and then it's kind of reflected over um, across wherever our vertex is. Okay, so quadratic functions, here's our parent function. So again, the most basic form, um, y equals x squared. So for that, we have a kind of that u-shaped graph, our parabola. So it looks like this, where the vertex is at the origin. Our domain is all real numbers, right? You can take any number and square it, but our range is restricted. It's 0 to infinity, right? Because if you square any number, it's going to be um, non-negative. A few things to remember. Sometimes our quadratic function is written in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c, in which case you can find um, the vertex by doing negative b over 2a which is what I did in the warm-up, um, and then you can plug that value into your function to find the y value of your vertex. Um, and then also sometimes our equation is written in this vertex form, so a times x minus h squared plus k, and here our vertex would be at hk. And you can always rewrite um, your function from this form to this, or vice versa. Right now, let's take a look at our cubic function. So here's our parent function, just y equals x cubed, the most basic form. Remember, this kind of makes this little S-shaped graph. It almost looks like um, our quadratic function, except the negative portion has been reflected. For this, our domain and range are both all real numbers because you can cube any number, and the result could be any number, right? Because a positive number cubed is, po is a positive, negative number cubed is a negative. Um, so just a few things, again, to remember, it does make this kind of S-shaped graph. 
A couple key points that you could always transform would be negative one, negative one, zero, zero, and one, one. So you could always use those to, and then you can use transformations to graph um, if you need to. All right, um, now I just wanna look at the general form of a polynomial function. Um, so this is that general form. So I know it looks a little intimidating, but essentially what's going on here is you have um, your degrees of x are just decreasing. So x to the power of n to the n minus one and so on and so forth until maybe you don't have any x value, you just have a constant. And um, here our domain is going to be all real numbers and the range, it really depends because you could have an absolute max or min or maybe your range is all real numbers. It really depends on the degree of our graph. Um, so typically, you know, a polynomial function could look, it could look a lot of different ways, but a few things to look for to help you um, graph. The first thing I would look for would be the degree, which is the highest power of x. So if you have an even degree, you have um, the same end behavior. So meaning you may have, um, a graph that looks something like this. So notice that on the left and the right, your graph is approaching positive infinity or both sides could be going towards negative infinity. And if you have an odd degree, then you have opposite end behavior. So maybe you have a graph that looks something like this. So notice um, going as x approaches positive infinity, um, f of x approaches positive infinity, and then on the left side, it's the opposite. So this side goes up, this side goes down. And then another thing that you can use to help you determine what your graph looks like um, is the leading coefficient, which would be um, a sub n in this case, and it determines the n behavior to the right. So if your leading coefficient is positive, your graph will go up to the right. If it's negative, your graph goes down. Um, and then just a few extra things to remember um, when you have multiplicity. So if you have a root that has more than one power, um, if you have an even multiplicity, then your graph is going to be tangent to the x-axis at that point. So you might have a graph that looks something like this. So here's just a simple quadratic equation, which is technically a type of polynomial equation. So here we'd have a double root. So notice it touches and turns around. So it doesn't actually cross over. But if you have an odd multiplicity, um, similar to our cubic function that we just saw, it kind of makes that flattened out S shape, but it does cross over our X axis. So it would look maybe something like this. So here you could see that it's not just crossing over, it is kind of flattening out, but it does eventually cross our graph. So that would be if you have like a triple root or um, a multiplicity of five or seven, any odd multiplicity greater than one. All right, the next um, type of function I wanna look at is radical functions. So here's our um, parent function, f of x equals the nth root of x. So I left it like this because, well, there's actually a different parent function for every um, n value, so for every index. So first, I wanna remind you guys that if n is even, so if you have like square root of x, um, you, do, you have a graph that looks something like this. And here you do have a restricted domain and range. Um, so for square root of x, our domain is 0 to infinity and our range is 0 to infinity. And the reason why is, well, your input, you can't take the square root of a negative number. So it must be 0 or larger. And then the result of a square root um, answer will always be a positive number unless there's a negative out front, um, really just the positive square root of any a non-negative number is going to be a positive number. So notice that all of our y values are zero or larger. So you have a graph that kind of makes this general shape. Um, but if n is odd, maybe like a cube root function, you get a shape more like you get something that looks like this. Um, so here our domain and range are both all real numbers because if you have a cube root or any other odd index, you can, you can take the cube root of a negative and the result can also be a negative. So you don't have that restriction that you see when n is even. Um, and then a few other things to remember. So for even roots, the radicand, so that's what's inside your root, must be greater than or equal to zero. Um, and that's a way that you can define the domain. And then the result also must be greater than or equal to zero. Unless there are, of course, some sort of transformation going on, um, then we, we can address that um, later on in this lesson.
All right, the next one to look at would be rational functions. So here I have the most basic form of rational functions, but we actually, you know, in the past have graphed pretty complex rational functions. They can, they can get pretty um, funky and they can have a lot of really interesting characteristics. But for the parent function, which is just one over X, um, you actually end up with a vertical and a horizontal asymptote. So our vertical and horizontal asymptotes are at X equals zero and Y equals zero. And then you get kind of a graph that looks like this. It's kind of like a hyperbolic looking graph. Um, for these, our domain is going to be everything except for zero. So that's our vertical asymptote. And our range is going to be also everything except for zero, which is our horizontal asymptote. So sometimes our um, rational function is written in this kind of transformational form. And when you have this, um, you can find your asymptotes by simply doing x equals h, so it's like essentially shifting left or right, and then y equals k, so it's essentially shifting your asymptote up or down. However, um, we did, as I said, graph much more complicated um, rational functions in the past, so just a quick refresher, um, if you have something like this, so ax then over bx to the power of m, and you can have more things going on within the numerator and den denominator within those polynomials, but um, you, one thing to look at is you need to compare the degree of the numerator to the degree of the denominator. So if the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, you're going to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. Um, because essentially, since your denominator is really going to be quote unquote larger, your graph is going to approach zero as x gets really large. Now, if the degrees are the same, so if n equals m, then you're going to have a horizontal asymptote, the ratio of your leading coefficient. So it's going to be at whatever a over b is. Um, and then if the degree of your numerator is larger than the degree of the um, denominator, you will not have a horizontal asymptote because really your, your numerator, if, you're, if it's the larger degree, it's really bigger on top, so your graph is just going to approach positive or negative infinity, but you may have some type of oblique asymptote, like a slant asymptote, um, or even, you know, different shaped asymptotes. Um, but again, we're really just focusing on comparing the degrees of the numerator and denominator to help us figure out if we have a horizontal asymptote and where it is. And then for vertical asymptotes, those are essentially going to occur wherever you have a domain restriction. So wherever essentially your denominator is equal to zero. All right, so the next type of function we're going to look at is exponential functions. And our parent function for this is just going to be b to the power of x. So some base to the power of x. A few things to remember about the base. Um, our base must be positive and it cannot be one. Um, so keep that in mind, that's extremely important. Um, if you see a negative out front, it should not be grouped with the B, and it would be um, a vertical reflection rather than part of the base. So our domain for these is going to be all real numbers, but our range is going to be restricted at zero to infinity, because if you have a positive base raised to a power, your answer is going to be positive. Um, and you are going to get a different um, graph depending on what the value of b is. So every base has its own parent function. Um, but if the, your base is between 0 and 1, you have an, uh, an exponential decay graph, and it ends up looking something like this. We do have horizontal asymptotes here um, at y equals 0. So your graph is going to approach 0, but it will never quite, quite touch the x-axis. And if your b value is greater than one, we have an exponential growth function, which really is uh, just a reflection over the y-axis. So it looks something like this. And they both go through that this key point of zero, one. It's always a great point to work with. Um, and it's easy to transform from there. And you could also transform um, your horizontal asymptote if you have some type of um, shift up or down. And I would say for this year, the most common type of exponential function that we're going to work with will be a base e exponential function. So it will be exponential growth, but just remember e is just approximately 2.7. Um, but again, that's going to be the most common one we'll be working with. All right, so now we're going to look at logarithmic functions, which are the inverses of exponential functions. So you'll notice that a lot of the features of these 
are similar to exponential functions, except um, the x's and y's have been flipped, or that you'll notice here the domain and range is flipped. So um, our parent function looks like this, log base b of x. And just like with our exponential functions, the base of our logarithm must be a positive number that is not equal to 1. Um, and for these, instead of having a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, we actually have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. And then again, you'll notice that um, our domain is 0 to infinity and our range is all real numbers, which is really just the swap version of the domain and range of our exponential functions. So depending on what your base is, um, it will change what your graph looks like. So if your base is between 0 and 1, you are going to have an, a decreasing graph. So it would look something like this. And if you have a base that is greater than 1, you are going to have an increasing graph. So it looks like this. So it's a general shape. So you'll notice that they both go through this key point of 1, 0, um, which you'll notice is the flip version of that key point that our exponential functions went through, which was 0, 1. Um, and from here, you also might notice that these look a lot like our exponential functions, except they're actually reflected over the line y equals x. Um, so that's another way you can graph logarithmic functions is just by reflecting um, your exponential function. Then a few um, special types of um, logarithmic functions. Remember, if you have a base e function, we call that a natural log, and we actually write it like this. It's ln of x. Um, we still read it natural log of x. And if you have a base 10 function, it's called a common log, and you write it like this so you don't see a base. So if you ever see this, you have to know that the base is 10. We could read it as common log of x. All right, this is going to be a super, super quick review of our trig functions because we covered these graphs in our last video. Um, but for sine and cosine, um, we have our wave-shaped graph. So here's positive 1, here's negative 1. So for sine, you get something that looks like this. We can continue that pattern to the left. And then for cosine, um, very similar shape, except you're starting up at the max. So it looks something like this. And continue the same pattern going to the left. Um, for both of these functions, the period is 2 pi. So that's the length that it takes um, to start repeating itself. So from here to here is 2 pi, or from here to here, and the amplitude is 1. Um, and again, just notice we do have that range restriction. Um, and then for tangent, um, here we have um, vertical asymptotes. So we have those at x equals pi over 2 and negative pi over 2, and that will occur every pi unit. So here we have that repeating vertical asymptote equation, and you end up with a graph that looks like this. And then that will repeat within each um, period, which in this case is pi. So just remember the period of tangent is shorter than the period for sine and cosine, at least for the parent functions. And notice that our domain is all real numbers except for our asymptotes, our vertical asymptotes, and our range is all real numbers. Okay, so some basic rules of transformations that we can use to help us graph. If f of x is the parent function, you may see any of these um, or any combination of these um, transformations. So these are all horizontal transformations and these are all vertical transformations. So here for the horizontal ones, you'll notice that all of the changes are being made specifically to x. So you'll see that they're grouped with x. So if you add or subtract from x, we call that a translation. So if you subtract from x, it's actually going to shift your graph to the right C units. And if you add, it's actually going to translate or shift your graph to the left. So remember those move in the opposite direction. If you multiply your x value, it's actually a, a horizontal stretch or shrink by a factor of one over C. So you have to remember this is a reciprocal factor. And um, if the reciprocal is greater than one, we call it a stretch. If the reciprocal is less than one, we call it a shrink. And um, those will always be positive. Um, if you have a negative, that's actually a different transformation. It's a reflection, and that will be over your y-axis, which is a horizontal type of reflection. Now you'll see over here, all of these are considered vertical transformations because um, you'll see the changes are being made to the entire function, which is kind of your y-value. So if you add or subtract, it translates or shifts your graph up or down. 
If you multiply, it's a vertical stretch or shrink by a factor of c. And if you have a negative, if you multiply by negative 1, it's a vertical reflection, which would be over our x-axis. So if you know how to graph your parent function and you know how to interpret transformations, you can graph just about any function that I throw at you. All right, so let's give this a try. Let's see if we can graph both of these functions using um, transformations, and then we'll also define the domain range. So for this first one, we have a square root function. So I'll just do my parent function maybe in black. I'll just do a dotted line. So I know that my square root function can find a couple key points, um, like square root of 0 is 0, square root of 1 is 1, square root of 4 is 2. So I have a couple key points here that we can transform. And then you can see that we have um, a vertical reflection. So anything that is being multiplied, so reflections or stretches or shrinks, those should really be applied to your graph first. So we have this vertical reflection, so all of our points are going to be reflected over our x-axis. And then I can see that we're also shifting left 2 and then up 3. So we're going to end up with a graph that looks something like this. And then we have here and here. And then our graph will look like this. So notice for these, I was just able to take, you know, these three points from my parent function. And again, I reflected them and I shifted left and up. Um, so for this, we can see that our domain and range are restricted. So our domain is going to be everything from negative 2 to infinity, and our range is from negative infinity to positive 3. Um, and just remember, for something like a square root function, the radicand must be greater than or equal to 0, because uh, you cannot take the square root of a negative, so you can always take whatever is in the radicand and say that it must be greater than or equal to 0. Okay, then we know that x must be... Um, greater than or equal to negative 2. Now let's look at this next function, um, natural log, or 2 times the natural log of x minus 1. So again, if I look at our parent function, we know that it goes through that point um, 0, 1, and it's going to have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. Um, so it looks something kind of like this. That's the general shape. Um, and now we can transform it. Um, we know that this graph is going to shift to the right one. So that's actually going to shift our um, vertical asymptote to the right one. So instead of being at um, x equals 0, it's going to be at x equals 1. It's also going to shift this key point to the right one. And then the vertical stretch by a factor of 2. It's actually going to move. It's just going to make our graph look um, a little bit less flat. So it'll look something like this. We could also find another key point from our graph and double that y value, but again, this is just kind of a rough sketch of our with our vertical um, stretch. So here our domain is going to be 1 to infinity, which you'll notice um, we're really just taking the domain of our parent function and also shifting it to the right one. And then our range is still all real numbers, so negative infinity to positive infinity. All right, so now we're going to try to graph this piecewise function. So remember, a piecewise function it looks like this, and it's where you can have different types of functions defined over different intervals of x. So here we have three different parts. We have a part, um, a quadratic portion, that is everything when x is less than negative 2. Then we have a linear portion, that's between negative 2 and 0. And then we have an exponential um, portion, that's when x is greater than 0. So let's start with um, the quadratic portion. So to graph this, we'll want to figure out where our vertex is. And we can, um, we can use that vertex formula like I did in the um, warm-up, or we can try completing the square and rewriting it in that vertex form. So let's do that just for a little review. So here um, we have x squared plus 6x. If I want to complete this square, Remember, you take your b value, you divide it by 2, and you square it. So the number that completes our square is 9. But we can't just add 9 to one side. We have to balance it out. So we actually are going to want to subtract it right back out over here. So really, we didn't change anything. We added 9 and subtracted 9, so the balance of our equation is still the same. And then we can factor this really quickly. 
and then here we have minus 4. So this is just a rewritten form of this equation. So we can see here that our vertex is at um, negative 3, negative 4. So that would fall within the range of the interval that we're graphing on. So here's negative 3, um, negative 4. And then I can kind of follow my 1, 3, 5 growth pattern going to the left and even going to the right. If I go to the right here, I can find the next coordinate. You will actually want to go all the way up to negative 2. You actually will want to figure out what the value would be at at negative 2. Um, and it is actually negative 3, um, but we'll just graph that with an open circle. So even though this function is not defined, this part of the function is not defined at negative 2, you'd still essentially want to plug in negative 2 to see what the value would be. Um, so this portion of our graph looks like this. And now let's work on this um, linear portion. So here uh, we have a graph that has a y-intercept at 2. And um, it is defined at 0. So that's part of our graph. And the slope is negative 1 half. So we can kind of follow that pattern backwards. And it actually brings us to negative 2. Um, but either way, we would want to really figure out what the value is at negative 2 and 0. And then you could also just connect those two points because it is linear. So it's going to look like this. Then the last portion we can graph is e to the power of x plus 1. So I know e to the power of x, it's an exponential function. And from the parent function, we know that that would usually go through the point um, 0, 1. However, it has been shifted up 1, so although this isn't defined at 0, this portion of our graph, um, it would be here, and that portion is already defined as this linear one, so we can actually start here. And then our graph is going to look something like this, so we'll kind of follow that exponential shape, um, continuing on to the right infinitely. So here we have our piecewise function, so you can see piecewise functions, sometimes they're continuous in some portions, like here, and sometimes they're not. Um, just depends on the function. All right, so next I want to talk about just some key characteristics of functions. So here I just have just a random function that um, I've sketched out on our axis, and we're going to try to define all of these things. So the first one is our domain. So we know domain is all the x values that are defined. So um, on the left, I can see that our lowest value is negative 4. And it does exist there because we have that closed circle. So it's negative 4. And the arrow on the right shows me that's going to move to the right infinitely. So negative 4 to infinity. And now for our range, so well, since our graph is going down forever, um, the low boundary is negative infinity. And it does have a maximum here. It doesn't ever go above this value, which is 2. And I know I'm meaning the graph goes a little bit above 2, but it's supposed to be at this exact um, point. Now, you may also be asked to describe where a graph is increasing or decreasing. So increasing means if you're tracing your um, graph from left to right, your pencil is going up. So we can actually see that our graph is increasing over two different intervals. It's increasing from here to here, and it's increasing right here. And when we describe that interval, we're going to describe the x values over which it's increasing. So it's actually increasing from x equals negative 3, or sorry, negative 4 to negative 2. So again, the x values over which it's increasing. So negative 4 to negative 2, and we'll include that turning point. And then it's also increasing from here to here. So those x values are from 1 to 3. So we'll say comma and then 1 to 3. Then decreasing just means if you're tracing your graph from left to right, your pencil's going down. So two intervals here that it's decreasing. So you can see from um, negative 2 to 1. And then you can see that it's also decreasing from here, which would be um, from 3 to um, infinity. Because it will keep in decreasing going to the um, right. Um, because again, because of that arrow. Um, now you may also be asked to describe where your graph is positive or negative. So positive just means above the x-axis and negative means below. And again, we describe that in terms of intervals of x. So our graph is positive, you can see above the x-axis, um, from here to here. So it's from negative 3 to negative 1. And we don't include these points because at negative 3 and negative 1 is not positive, it's 0. You can also see that our graph is above our x-axis here between 2 and 4. 
and then negative just means below the um, below the x-axis. So it's negative here um, from negative four to negative three. And then here from negative one to two. And then again here, it's going to keep being negative everything um, to the right of four, so four to infinity. All right, um, x-intercepts we know are the points at which it crosses the x-axis. These should be written as coordinates. Um, so we have an x-intercept at negative three, zero, negative one, zero, two, zero, and four, zero. So remember x-intercepts occur when your y value is zero. And now it's a little bit confusing. These are coordinates, these are interval, intervals. So just maybe make a note of it. Um, these are actual coordinates. I know it's written the same as our interval um, notation, so just be careful with that. And we're also going to do the y-intercept as a coordinate. So our y-intercept is when x is zero, so it's zero, negative two. And then we can look for absolute max and min. So absolute max and min is if there is a, a point that is the absolute highest or lowest, so saying your graph never goes above or below. So here we actually do have an absolute maximum value. Our graph never goes above the value y equals two. However, um, our graph goes down forever, so there's actually no absolute minimum, so none. And then a relative max or min is a, um, a hill or valley, so it's a maximum or a minimum that is um, relative to the points around it, a high or low point, but it's not the absolute highest or lowest. And we could also think of it as a turning point. Um, we could also include our endpoints here. So we have for our maximums, for our relative max, we can include the absolute max in there as well. So like something can be a relative and an absolute max. But we also see we have another turning point here. So when essentially when we're changing from increasing to decreasing, we'll have some sort of maximum. So that occurs at y equals one. And then for minimums, we could use this endpoint, but it's also the same as this one right here. Um, and I guess a, a minimum we'll say will occur when it's um, changing from decreasing to increasing. So that will be at y equals negative three. So again, these are just some ways to describe key fe features of your function. So it's really important to you know, do a quick refresher of these because we'll be using different variations of these throughout the year. All right, I wanna do a super, super quick review of what the definition of an even and odd function is. Uh, maybe this is something that you kind of breezed over in the past, but it will be a really important concept for us this year. So just by definition, an even function is when f of negative x equals f of x. So essentially what it means is if you plug in a negative x value, the opposite version of an x value, it gives you the same y value as the positive version. So f of positive x gives you the same value as f of negative x. Graphically, it just means that your graph is reflected over the y-axis. So if you look here, like the graph um, x squared, you know, if you plug in positive one, you get positive one. If you plug in negative one, you get positive one. So the opposite x values give you the same y values. Um, now the definition of an odd function is that f of negative x gives you negative f of x, meaning that if you plug in the opposite x value, it gives you the opposite y value. So for example, here, here's a cubic function, which is a very classic odd example. If you plug in positive one, the result is positive one. And if you plug in negative one, the result is negative one. So notice by plugging in the opposite y value, or sorry, x value, you actually get the opposite y value as well. Graphically, it's um, when your graph is um, rotated 180 degrees about the origin, or we could say reflected over the origin. So let's do a quick test of whether or not these graphs or these functions are even odd or neither. So essentially we can figure it out by plugging in f of negative x and seeing how it compares to our um, original function. So if you plug in negative x, so if you're squaring a negative number, it's going to essentially stay the same. So once we simply, and a constant number will always stay the same because there's no variable. So notice by plugging in the negative version of x, we end up with the same exact function that we started with. So since f of negative x is exactly the same as f of x, we can call these this function even.
Not all quadratic functions are even, just so you know, but um, many are. Now, if you look at part B, again, let's plug in negative x and see what happens. So we have the cube root of negative x minus 2. Um, so something like this, well, um, I guess we could simplify it to see if that helps us at all. So maybe we can factor this out. We know the cube root of negative 1 is negative 1. Okay, so g of negative x equals negative cube root of x plus 2. So you'll see that it's not just the opposite of our original function because look at the inside. This changed from x minus 2 to x plus 2. So actually, this well, the functions are not the same and they are not exactly opposites. So this one would actually be neither. And then if you look at this last example, h of x, so let's plug in negative x. If you cube a negative number, it gives us a negative value, so we get this. And here, if you just make this negative, then it will change that sign as well. So if you look at this, when we plugged in h of negative x, it actually gave us negative h of x. Notice everything became opposite. This term became opposite and this term became opposite. So just by definition, this function would be considered odd. So that's how you can test to see if functions are even odd or neither. All right, and the last thing we're going to review in today's video is um, compositions of functions. So here um, we are given two functions, f of x is square root of x and g of x is 2x minus 3. And we're going to find the following compositions and their domains. Um, so here, this is one way you can denote a composition of functions. It also means the same thing as this. So this means f of g of x. So when you have a composition of functions like this, you're essentially taking the second function here, or the inside function, and plugging it into the outer function. So here we're actually um, going to plug g of x into f of x. So we're really doing f of 2x minus 3. So I'm taking 2x minus 3 and I'm plugging it in here, which gives us the square root of 2x minus 3. So that's f of g of x. And then to define the domain of this function, just remember that the radicand must be greater than or equal to 0. So x must be greater than or equal to 3 halves. So our domain is 3 halves to infinity. That's our domain. Yeah. Okay, now for this next one, we're doing g of f of x. So this time we're plugging this function into this one. So we're essentially doing g of square root of x. So I'm going to plug square root of x in right here. So we have 2 times the square root of x minus 3. Right? I substituted square root of x wherever I saw x in our function. Um, so this is g of f of x. And for this one, again, the only restriction we need to look for for our domain is that our radicand is greater than 0, or greater than or equal to 0. So our domain is just 0 to infinity. So it is also very possible to do a composition of functions with itself. So here we have f of f of x. So we're going to be plugging square root of x into itself. So we actually have the square root of the square root of x. So we could leave our answer like this, or we could simplify it. It may be helpful to simplify it by rewriting it with rational exponents. So remember, square root of x is um, x to the 1 half, so it looks like this. And then here we would uh, multiply our exponents, so we end up with x to the 1 fourth, so it's really the fourth root of x, that would be our function. And since it's an even root function, we just know again, the radicand must be greater than or equal to 0, so our domain is 0 to infinity. And last we have g of g of x, so with into our g of x function, we're going to plug in 2x minus 3. So that gives us 2 times 2x minus 3 minus 3. And then we would just um, simplify that. We'll combine like terms after we distribute. So we get 4x minus 9 as our function. And since this is just a linear function, we know that our domain is simply all real numbers. All right, so that is all for our video for today. Thank you so much for watching.